Okay, great. <coughs> so, <coughs> welcome everyone. So, we will continue on zero knowledge proofs. So, just to remind you, last time we looked at zero knowledge proofs for the graph isomorphism problem, and we had a nice unconditional construction for uh, the zero knowledge proof, which relied on various properties of the graph, graph isomorphism problem. <clears throat> so where we stopped was we saw a three round protocol, which had soundness parameter half, which means that uh, at least with probability half, uh, <clears throat> a cheating prover is guaranteed to fail, but with probability half, uh, the cheating prover might succeed just by guessing the guess, uh, by, by guessing the challenge of the verifier. So let me remind you <clears throat> uh, what the protocol wa was, and then we will see how to get a protocol with better soundness parameter. Okay, so let's try to recall where we were. So we had a prover, we had a verifier, and then there was common input G0 and G1, which was the description of two graphs. And then prover also had the witness, which was pi, such that G0 equals pi of G1, where pi is this uh, permutation, right? So the first step was prover would generate a random permutation sigma of the graph and then would send a graph G where G equals sigma of G0. Then the verifier was supposed to send a random bit B and then prover would respond back with either sigma or sigma composed with pi, right? So B sorts of decides which isomorphism the verifier is interested in looking at. If B is zero, then you have to show that G is isomorphic to G zero. Otherwise you have to show that G is isomorphic to G one. And if you have Sigma, then you can test that G is isomorphic to G zero just by applying Sigma to G zero. Otherwise you apply Sigma times pi to G one and you can match it with G, <clears throat> right? So verifier learns one of the isomorphisms, but not both. And how did we prove soundness? The main idea is that if G zero is not isomorphic to G one, then either G is not isomorphic to G zero or G is not isomorphic to D one. And then for at least one of the challenges, the prover is going to fail. So the prover P starts fails with probability at least half. So we have made some progress, but obviously half is not something that we want, right? We want a cheating prover we start to fail with probability very close to one, ideally one minus negligible. So let's look at soundness amplification. And a very natural idea for amplifying soundness is that you just repeat the protocol several times. If the prover succeeds every time, then you have good confidence that in fact, prover is not lying, right? So let's say you repeat the protocol K times.
and we have to be careful here. What do I mean when I say repeat k times? So you have to start from the first round and you have to choose a new random permutation every time. So what happens if you uh, don't choose a new sigma every time? Then zero noise property is trivially violated, <clears throat> right? Because if let's say I use the same sigma twice, then the verifier can, can send a challenge corresponding to B equals zero, then the verifier can also ask for B equals one. And then the verifier learns isomorphism between G and G zero as well as G and G1, which means that now you can compute the permutation between G0 and G1. So essentially you learn the witness. So the protocol now looks something like the following. You send GI where I is sort of the ith iteration. the verifier sends bi and the prover responds with sigma i or sigma i times pi. And you run this for i equals one to k, okay? And because there's a separate sigma i every time, you cannot combine the information uh, from uh, different iterations. So let's call these k iterations. Sometimes you call them k sessions and so on. So now my claim is that this simple repeated protocol has uh, soundness very close to one. So what is the probability? So say G0 is not isomorphic to G1, then the probability that uh, P star succeeds is half in each iteration. So what is the probability that P star succeeds in all K iterations. So this probability is at most one by two to the power K. Which also means that probability that V rejects is at least one minus one by two to the power K. Okay, which is negligibly close to one. So this is one minus negligible in K. And here K can be seen as your security parameter, the larger you set K to be, the closer you are uh, going to get to one. But you can never reach all the way to one. There, is, there will always be some small negligible probability that a cheating prover P star might succeed. And that is inherent in zero knowledge proofs or in most zero knowledge proof protocols. Now this is fine, but what about uh, now the zero knowledge property. So in the last class we saw that a single invocation is zero knowledge, right? But now we are running the same protocol K times. Maybe 
it is not zero knowledge anymore right at least it's not completely trivial to see so let's try to prove that even these k iterations when put together <clears throat> uh they will be zero knowledge so why is the probability less than or equal to this why not equal well it depends on p star right if p star uh, is not so intelligent the probability of success can even be zero okay so so to prove that this protocol is zero knowledge we will have to do something slightly different we need to introduce the idea of rewinding so let's recall the previous simulator so this is the simulator for a single iteration right <clears throat> so let's denote the simulator by s the idea was that s samples a random bit b prime and um invokes the code of the verifier v star and sends g equals sigma of so s samples b prime and sigma where sigma is a random permutation and sends g equals sigma of g of b prime to v star <clears throat> second round as receives uh b from v star next if b happens to be equal to b prime send sigma to v star else you restart you go back to step 1 so this was our simulator and now uh, the simulator has to go through not just a single iteration but k iteration right so let's try to modify this for k iterations let me just write it from scratch this is zero knowledge for the full protocol the natural idea is as follows <clears throat> so s <clears throat> samples b prime 1 sigma 1 for the first iteration and sends uh sigma 1 g of b prime 1 to v star the next step is to receive b1 from v star and then finally if uh b1 happens to be b prime of 1 send sigma 1 else you restart so let me call this step 1.1 1.2 and 1.3 so this is as far as the first iteration goes so let's continue let's look at some intermediate step i.1 i.2 and i.3 so here s is going to sample 
B prime of I sigma I send sigma I G of B prime I to V star then you get B I and then if B I happens to be B prime I you can proceed to the next round send sigma I else what do you do that is the question so let's say else restart and go to 1.1 just go all the way back to the beginning okay and then similarly eventually maybe the simulator will get back uh, we'll get to the end so what is the problem with this it's exponential time yeah exactly so here the problem is in every iteration, the simulator will fail with probability half, right? So simulator can continue. There's a lot of iterations. In one or the other, simulator is going to fail, right? If the simulator goes all the way back to the step 1.1, then the simulator will just keep running and running, right? The, sim the probability that simulator will go to the end is uh, just 1 by 2 to the power k, which is very little. So the number of trials that you need to get back to the end is something like two to the power k, which is exponential in k. So that's not something that we want. Now the question is, how do we fix this problem? Presumably you could just like jump back by one and go to i minus 1.1. Yeah, and why can we do that? How does the simulator just go back a few steps, not all the way to the beginning? So, because it could have just like reused the same things it chose for those ones. Yeah, so the idea is S saves the snapshot of V star state state of this program or state of this verifier at every point or maybe at every round. So a lot of copies, a lot of states, like, right? Uh, for example, once I get done with I1.1, I immediately save the state of the verifier after that point, after this point, after this point and so on, right? So. What I can do is I can pick any of these states and start executing that state from that point on, right? And just imagine you have the code Vista, you are running Vista on your own. So you can do whatever you want. You can, uh, you can save a copy of Vista at any point in the protocol execution. You can go back to that copy and you can start execution, executing from this point onwards, okay? So here we will just slightly change our protocol. You don't restart else go to I point one and choose fresh B prime one, B prime I, sorry, and Sigma I. And then you try again, right? And again, with probability half, you might fail, with probability half, you might succeed. But uh, in expectation, you just need two trials to get to uh, the end of this ith iteration, right? So each iteration requires you um, like in expectation two trials and by linearity of expectation now, approximately the number of trials that you will need is like just two times k, okay? So, yeah, so here is our claim. S is indeed
expected PPT. And by the way, this is a very important idea in cryptography used everywhere. So this is called rewinding. Rewinding the adversary. So th this might look obvious in retrospect, but this is like a really deep, very fundamental idea in cryptography. By rewinding the adversary, you can do magic. So let me look at the question. To be clear, S can choose what to add to its transcript, so it need not put the transcript communication from field. Yes, that's, uh, that's exactly correct. So as soon as some transcript fails, you throw away that part of the transcript, you go back to the previous state, and then you continue from that point. And eventually you will get back to the end of the kth iteration, and that would give you a transcript which was successful from one to k. From beginning all the way to the end, and that is the transcript that the simulator outputs. And by the way, here's a general lemma, which I will not try to prove, but it's a very useful fact to keep in mind. Sequential repetition of any zero knowledge protocol continues to remain zero knowledge. So in describing our simulator, uh, we didn't really use any special properties of the, um, of the graph isomorphism problem. Does this work only if the state of V star in every round is of constant size? No, it can be any polynomial size. Right, because at most, how many states you are storing at any given point of time? It's uh, even if you are storing the state after every round, how many rounds are there? 3K rounds, right? So you are storing 3K states and 3K times polynomial is still polynomial. So this, this rewinding idea, I should stress, it's very powerful. It's used in zero knowledge proofs. It will be used in secure multi-party computation, which will be our next topic. Um, essentially any interactive cryptographic protocol, uh, the security of that probably relies on rewinding in some way or the other. Any other questions? Okay, good. So, so far we have seen zero knowledge proof for the graph isomorphism problem, right? Um, so that's good, but why is this problem useful at all? Right, seems like a random problem and uh, seems like it just had the right properties for us to build a zero knowledge proof for it. Um, what about zero knowledge proofs for circuit satisfiability, three set, proving solution of mathematical equations and so on. So there's just so many things that we want to do, right? And here comes the big idea. We can actually design zero knowledge proof for all of NP. So what we need to do is, again, let me remind you uh, the definition of NP and NP completeness. Um, an NP-complete problem uh, is a problem to which 
every problem in np can be reduced to right so what this means is that if you have a zero knowledge proof for an np complete problem you actually have a zero knowledge proof proof for every problem in np and we will see this in more detail so we will build zero knowledge proof for the graph isomorphism problem sorry the graph three curling problem so graph isomorphism is not known to be an np complete problem we don't have any polynomial time algorithms for this problem but in, but in fact there are good reasons to believe that it is not going to be proven to be an np complete problem anytime soon because there are better algorithms even though they are not polynomial time but graph three curling it is known to be an np complete problem it's a very famous np complete problem what is graph three curling so let's take any graph and now you are given three colors red green blue or maybe let's call the colors to be maybe just let's just call them 1 2 3 3 okay and your goal is to assign colors to every vertex let's say 1 2 uh 3 maybe one again you have to color every vertex such that you can look at any edge in the graph and its end points should have different colors so for every edge vertices should have different colors and if that is the case we call this to be a valid graph three coloring so is this a valid three coloring clearly not because you look at this edge and the two end points both have the same color so let me change this uh, slightly so i'll put one here and two here okay so this turns out to be a valid three coloring in fact this is even a valid two coloring you look at any any edge uh, it will have colors one and two now let me make the graph a little bit more complex what about this graph so clearly this is not a valid coloring anymore but what i can do is i can put now three here so i am using all three colors let's make the graph even more complex what about this graph so clearly now if you look at this edge it has one and one does there exist a valid three coloring of this graph no because every vertex is connected to every other vertex and there are four vertices this means that you really need four colors you cannot you cannot succeed with three colors so this graph does not have a valid three color so we were lucky that the graph was so small just just imagine i give you some complex graph having let's say 1000 vertices right you will probably end up spending a lifetime in trying to see if this graph has a valid three coloring or not so now our problem is uh, prover and the verifier they are both given a graph the graph itself is public and the proof in addition is also given a witness which is some valid three coloring of this graph and the prover would like to convince the verifier that the graph has a valid three coloring without revealing the three coloring itself if we do that then that's great we will have the knowledge for an np complete problem and we will see later on how to use it for essentially any problem that you want okay so um so in the last zero knowledge proof uh, for the graph isomorphism problem we didn't end up using any cryptography no encryption no digital signatures nothing right that is not the case for uh, zero knowledge for np 
for the graph three cousin problem, we will need a new cryptographic primitive, which we will call commitment schemes. Commitment scheme is a very fundamental primitive in cryptography. Even though we are introducing it in the context of zero knowledge, uh, it is used in a lot of different places in cryptography. For example, we will use it in the, in the secure multi-party computation uh, later on as well. So what is a commitment scheme? At a very high level, a commitment scheme is like a note placed in some locked safe or a locked box. So here we have a committer and a verifier, a committer and a receiver. Committer can write some value on a small piece of paper. Let's call this value to be M, okay? This box is locked and this is sent to the receiver, right? At this point, we have two properties. One is the hiding property, which says that R cannot learn M at this point because the box is locked. So this is very similar to encryption. Committer could have encrypted M and sent it across to the receiver. The second property, which makes it slightly different from encryption is the binding property. Binding property means that C can't change M. It's already inside the box. The box has gone to the receiver. And at a later point, the committer can send the key. Let me draw the key here. Okay, maybe I hope it looks like a key. Uh, and this key will allow the receiver to unlock this box and recover the message M, right? So once the box is gone, committer has no control over what the message is. It's already decided, it's gone. And later on, uh, you can send the key to reveal the message. So, so we need like some electronic equivalent of this, this concept. So let's try to define uh, electronic or cryptographic commitment scheme. Okay, so, so this is maybe just the intuition. And now let's try to define it more formally. And then we will try to construct commitment schemes. Okay, so commitment schemes, uh, we have two parties, we have C and R, committer and the receiver. Committer has some input string, which is the message M. And there are two phases, which any commitment scheme has. So phase one is the commit phase, or also called as the commitment phase. So in this phase, C generates a random S, some random number, computes and sends C equals com of M comma S where com is a polynomial time algorithm. You can even think of com as some kind of encryption of the message M. The second stage is known as the decommit stage or decommitment stage. So here C can just send M comma S 
to R R checks if com of M comma S matches with the received value in commit phase. If so, except M, as the receiver rejects. So this is just the syntax. How do we define the security of a commitment scheme? So there are two properties. <clears throat> so maybe before the security, let's talk about completeness, which is if both parties are honest, R accepts the message M. Okay, then we have hiding. Hiding just says that at the end of the commit phase, the receiver has no idea what the message M is. And we will formalize it very similar to encryption by using computational indistinguishability. So for all M0 and M1, Commitment of M0 looks very similar to the commitment of M1. Looks computationally indistinguishable. Com of M0, comma S, such that S is sampled at random from the uniform distribution. This is computationally indistinguishable to commitment of M1, comma S. this is almost identical to encryption. Then we have the binding property, which is what separates this notion from encryption schemes. So essentially given com of M comma S, M is unique. So in more detail, if M0 is not equal to M1, for every S0 and S1, column of M0, S0 cannot be the same as com of M1 and S1. Okay, any questions? Does this make sense? Because if these two commitments were to be the same, that means that there exist two different D commitments, one to M0 and S0, another to M1 and S1, where M0 and M1 would be different. So that's not what we want. We want the message to be fixed, to be unique, given this commitment. So now let's try to build 
government schemes. Attempt one, which is bound to fail. So why not just try to use any encryption scheme to build a commitment scheme? And here the idea would be that the committer would send the encryption under some key of the message to the receiver. And then later on in the decommit phase, the committer will just send the encryption, uh, will send the key and the message, and the receiver can just check if the ciphertext matches. So in particular, maybe let's look at one time pad. So committer sends M XR, um, let's say some key K. And then later on, committer sends M and K to R. Is this a valid commitment scheme? It's not binding. Yeah, it's not binding at all. In fact, given the cipher text, I can really open it to any message, right? I can choose my message M prime, and then I can send M prime and K prime such that C is also equal to M prime XOR K prime. So it is not binding at all. Like I can open to anything. Why don't we encrypt the key comma message? We are encrypting the message, right? Using one time pad. Yeah, I don't know what, what do you mean by encrypt. Isn't one time pad an encryption? Encrypt K comma M. Well, again, if I use encryption, if let's say I use one time pad for encryption, this is not going to be binding. And just that wouldn't work because in one time pad, you need like the key to be the same length as the message. And so if you're encrypting the key with the message, the key won't be long enough to encrypt both itself and the message. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about some kind of circular encryption. Okay, so yeah, so this, this is just to demonstrate that commitment scheme is actually indeed different from, uh, from encryption, but it's not that different. In particular, uh, basically Algamal encryption is also a commitment scheme. And we call that to be Algamal commitment. Okay, so the idea is the following, your message M must be the element of a group and we need a generator of this group G. And as the first step, the committer C samples A and B in Z order of the group. And sends g to the power a, g to the power b, let me write it in the next line, and sends c equals g to the power a, g to the power b, and n times g to the power ab. So this is your uh, commitment stage. How do you open? C sends A comma B comma M. Okay. And the idea is that given G to the power A, A is unique. 
as long as A is coming from this, uh, this group. Similarly, given G to the power B, B is unique. And hence, these two values sort of fix G to the power AB. And now this means that this fix is M as well. So R checks A against G to the power A. B against G to the power B and then computes M times G to the power AB if A and B are correct. And matches with the value in C in the commitment, which is given. So uh, why can't we use this scheme that like, uh, we have a key, we encrypt the, like using one time pad, we first apply a PRG on the key and make it the size of key plus message and we encrypt key pad, key concatenation message and then send it to the uh, person. So let me finish this. I will come to something like that. Okay, sorry. sir. sir. After that. So let's try to prove hiding and binding. It's really simple. So let's jump from here to here. How do you prove hiding? Just a simple observation from DDH. From DDH, you should be able to prove that G to the power A, G to the power B, M zero times G to the power AB, it looks actually computationally indistinguishable from G to the power A, G to the power B, M one times G to the power AB. This follows from the DDH assumption. In fact, the Elgamal encryption really uses the same identical argument. How do we prove binding? A and B are unique. Given G to the power A and G to the power B. And this follows from the fact that G is a generator. Because what is the property of a generator? If, if you choose two different elements from Z of G, then G to the power of these two different elements would give you two different group elements. And once A and B are unique, you know, prover's hands are really tied. Okay, any questions? So now there was some demand for maybe something based on PRGs and things like that. Uh, so that, yeah, you can build commitment schemes that way as well. Um, and the benefit of that is that so far we are relying on the DDH assumption, right? Which is a very specific assumption. Maybe it will be broken in the future. Quantum computers can already break DDH assumption if you're able to build quantum computers which is a big if, but, uh, but there are uh, 
other type of assumptions from which we can build like one way function encryption schemes and so on the question is can we also build commitment schemes from different type of assumptions okay so here we will look at commitments from any one to one one way function it cannot be any one way function it has to be one to one way function in fact building commitment schemes as i defined from any one way function it's a big open problem so one to one one way functions is the best uh, that we can do <coughs> and we will use the notion of how how to build is also how you build prgs okay so you are given f is a one to one one way function h is a hard core predicate of um f so how do you commit to some message and for simplicity say your message is a bit and then uh, later on we will see how to extend how to go to longer strings so so in the commitment stage the committer samples a random x and this should be from the domain of the one way function and then sends the following commitment f of x comma h of x xor the message okay and what is the intuition uh, given f of x h of x is really uniform it's the hard core predicate and hence now this is like a one time path but the nice thing is if f is a one to one one way function f of x fixes x entirely in the decommitment phase s sends um x and m okay now r can check the validity of x from f of x f of x is something which r already received and then checks and then maybe computes h of x x star m and again matches that with the value received in the commitment stage okay so let's look at hiding hiding and binding properties how do you prove hiding follows from the property of hard core predicates so we can see that uh, f of x h x x or m1 that should be computationally indistinguishable where x is sampled uniformly so 
So this should really be the domain of the one way function. I'm assuming that the domain is uh, uniform. This is computationally indistinguishable from f of x, b x r m, sorry, this is m0, m0 where x is uniform and b is uniform. And now this is like a one-time pair. So in fact, this is identical to f of x, b, x, r, m1. And this is the same. And this is now computationally distinguishable to f of x, Now X is uniform. Okay, so essentially this is the commitment to M0 and this is the commitment to M1. And these two commitments are indistinguishable from each other. Okay, does the hiding property make sense? Any questions? Now, what about the binding property? How do we prove binding? Well, binding just directly follows from the fact that uh, given f, f of x, x is unique in some sense. There only exists a single value of x, which leads to this particular value of f of x. And this, this follows from the fact that f is a one to one, one way function. And once x is unique, uh, you know, that fixes h of x, and that is sufficient for you to recover the message. Yeah, so Rohan, is that what you were talking about or did you have some other scheme in mind? Yeah, this is something, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So yeah, something on the same lines, just I was like, initially when I messaged that encrypt key comma M, I was just saying that we take the concatenation of the key comma the message and we extend the key using the PRG and encrypt key comma M and then send it to the adversary or like the other person. But PRG does not necessarily have collision resistance. Yeah, that, that part I missed actually. That part was incorrect. Like mm -hmm. that part now got clear to me when you did this proof. Okay, good. So this scheme only allows you to encrypt one bit messages. What about encrypting? long messages. How do you encrypt long messages? Any thoughts? So can you take an encryption, can you take a commitment scheme for a single bit message and generically extend it to a commitment scheme for multiple messages. So like why can't you use multiple, multiple hard cord? Oh. Sorry, sorry, go on, go on, Matt. Sorry, could you use multiple hard code predicates of um, F? One for each. Oh, you are getting muted for some reason. Yeah, but I think I understood what you're saying. So um, yeah, that makes sense. So just, uh, I mean, you don't even need to go into the details of this encrypt, this commitment scheme. Just
commit to each bit separately. And by the way, this, this idea works not just for commitment schemes, but also for encryption schemes and so on. If I give you an encryption scheme, which only allows you to encrypt a single bit message, how do you encrypt a long message? Well, just encrypt it bit by bit, right? So here again, we have the same thing. Just choose a fresh X for every bit and uh, just, uh, you know, just commit to every bit separately. From the hiding property, every single bit is hidden. And you can have a hybrid argument where you change the message from M0 to M1 bit by bit. So this would work even if M0 and M1 are long. Okay, so maybe let's, let's look at this idea in, uh, in slightly more detail. So M0 and M1 are long messages, let's say. So you start with commitment of M01. This represents the first bit of M0. And there's uh, random numbers everywhere. So S1, commitment of M02, S2. And you can do this for any commitment scheme, as I said. Okay. So this should be computationally indistinguishable from commitment of, let's just change the first bit, M11, M1, and the remaining bits are the same, M02, S2, and so on, and then you keep going. Eventually you started with M0, eventually you will end up with, uh, with M1. And the only difference between this distribution and this distribution is just the first commitment, which is a commitment to a single bit. And now by the hiding property of this commitment scheme, you can argue that this distribution and this distribution is computationally indistinguishable. And the binding property also follows. Uh, you have binding for every single bit. And that also means that you have binding overall. So this is known as the Blum commitment scheme. So this was uh, introduced by Manuel Blum, who, um, who has been a professor at CMU. He just uh, recently retired. Um, he was also the one who introduced this notion of commitment schemes. And he introduced commitment schemes in a very different context, nothing to do with zero knowledge and so on. Uh, in fact, commitment schemes, this notion predates the notion of zero knowledge. So he introduced this notion in the context of coin flipping over the telephone, which is a very interesting notion. And we will look at that in, 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 uh, in one of our MPC lectures. So the problem of coin flipping over the phone or over the, over the internet is as follows. So suppose you and I cannot meet uh, because of the virus or whatever, right? And we need to decide maybe who gets the car or maybe whatever, right? We just want to flip a fair coin. So how do you do that? Well, it's completely unclear, right? If uh, we agree that I will flip the coin, then I can always flip a coin and I can, um, I can uh, lie about the outcome to, to my favor, right? So can we design a fair coin flipping protocol over the phone, over the internet? Or you can even run the protocol by, uh, by letters. Like we each write a letter to each other and after, uh, after a few letters, we both have a bit which is guaranteed to be uniform. So very interesting problem, which we will look at later on. Okay, so now uh, given that we only have like uh, less than 15 minutes, maybe we will go to the actual zero knowledge protocol in the next class. And we will stop here for today. <laughs>